Welcome to another extra video. In this one, we will be diving into the history education I received in high school. While writing this script, I have the official notes written by my teacher as to what we should know for the exams. I haven't opened this book in years, so I have no clue how accurate it is while writing this intro. While writing this script, I will not be filling in any of the gaps myself, I will only give you the story of world history as my education system told it to me. With most borders shown being taken from pictures in the book or inferred from the text, and they will only be updated when mentioned by the book. I would have liked to mention the flaws and the gaps in education within this video, but that would mean that we would be here for hours, so that's maybe something for a future video. So, the story of world history starts with ancient Greece, as it was the Greeks and the Romans who laid the foundation of our current Western society, especially in terms of politics, art and philosophy. But Greece as a state didn't exist. Because of the Greek mountains making communication difficult, Greece was divided into many different polis, or cities, each with their own governments, laws and armies. Each city-state fit one of five government forms. Monarchy, single hereditary ruler. Aristocracy, ruled by hereditary nobles. Democracy, ruled by the people. Oligarchy, ruled by the wealthy. And tyranny, ruled by a single person in a non-hereditary way. Meanwhile in Italy, there was the city-state of Rome. Rome started off as a monarchy, but turned into an aristocratic republic. These Roman aristocrats would drive Rome's expansion, as conquests were a great way to establish yourself as a popular and influential person within Rome. Soon, Rome would have taken control over most of Italy, and gotten into a conflict with their main rival, Carthage. A first war would see Sicily being taken away from Carthage, after which Carthage came very close to conquering Rome itself under General Hannibal, but in the end, the Carthaginians failed to conquer Rome, and Rome completely destroyed Carthage. One particularly ambitious general was Julius Caesar, who went on a conquest of Gaul and proclaimed himself dictator. The other aristocrats didn't like his dictatorship and so killed him. This caused a civil war to erupt, which allowed Augustus to come to power and proclaim himself emperor. This emperorship lauded the start of the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. Across the Roman-held lands, Peace reigned and prosperity rose. But what made the Romans so special? What caused them to manage to conquer so much of Europe? Well, Rome had a great desire for conquest fueled by their aristocrats. Great and disciplined armies, good administrative talents, road building, and finally, tolerance for the regions they conquered. Adding to these Roman traits, when Rome conquered Greece, they were incredibly impressed by Greek culture. Rome took on Greek art and science, adding these to the previously mentioned Roman traits, creating the Greco-Roman culture. This Greco-Roman culture would spread throughout the Roman Empire. To the north of the boundaries of Rome were Germanic barbarians, who were respected by the Romans for their great fighting abilities. These Germanics would be recruited by the Romans to serve in their armies and defend their borderlands, causing these barbarians to slowly become more and more Roman. One group of these Germanics were the Batavians, in the modern day Netherlands. These Batavians revolted against the Romans and won a couple of battles before they were eventually defeated. This was a significant event because it's seen as the first Dutch War of Independence. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, there was a religion known as Judaism, the first ever religion to only have one god. The Jews lived in this region called Judea, but they revolted against Roman rule, causing the Romans to evict the Jews from the region and creating the Jewish diaspora. But before that, there was a guy called Jesus, who called himself a prophet and traveled around Judea. The Romans considered him a troublemaker and crucified him. This would cause his followers to compile and spread the story of Jesus, writing it down into what would eventually become the Bible. Christianity would slowly spread across the Roman Empire, despite the Romans persecuting Christians for not worshipping the Roman gods. The popularity of Christianity would lead to Emperor Constantine eventually allowing Christianity and Emperor Theodosius making Christianity the official Roman religion. A bit later in Arabia, Mohammed would receive a mission from an angel to spread the word of God and write it down in the Quran. Mohammed would take charge of Arabia and the successors to Mohammed would continue to conquer, seemingly coming out of nowhere and conquering the Middle East, North Africa, Spain and Southern France, only then being stopped by the Franks. In the East though, the Islamic conquest would continue, with eventually even Constantinople falling, ending the Eastern Roman Empire, and spreading deep into Eastern Europe from there. But how did the Muslims manage to conquer this quickly? Well, they were trained horseback riders, allowing them to march with great speed. Their living in the desert caused them to be tough people, 
while Islam gave unity to the Arabians, causing them to march as one. Another additional help is that anyone who joined in the conquests got to go to heaven. The two main targets of the conquest, the traditional great powers of the Persian and Roman empires, were also massively weakened by fighting each other, meaning that they could easily be overthrown by a third power. Furthermore, the Arabs were tolerant to the Jews and Christians who were conquered, lowering resistance to their conquests. Meanwhile in the West, the Western Roman Empire has collapsed. Without the central government of the Romans, the large road networks that used to be maintained slowly disappeared and illiteracy massively spread. Without the Romans providing safety, commerce and trade collapsed and Europe returned to being an agriculture based society. But these new farmers still needed security, which they found in the system of serfdom. Farmers would get local lords to protect them and in exchange the farmers would work the lands of the lord. This would evolve into the feudal system. Without roads or literate people, it became near impossible to control a large piece of land from a single point. This meant that two types of lords began to develop, lieges and vassals. A liege would give lands to a vassal to govern and in exchange the vassal would provide loyalty and armies to the liege. This was increasingly important since European warfare was increasingly done by horseback and horses were extremely expensive to maintain. Via this feudal system, the cost of a horseback army could be spread among vassals. But there was one big problem with the feudal system. The liege very quickly lost much of their control over their vassals, as the vassals gave their land out to their children, and those children didn't necessarily hold much loyalty to their official lord. Generation after generation, the loyalty inherent to the feudal system would start to erode. Religiously speaking, a split had happened in the Christian world. The emperor used to have full control over religion, but in the Western Roman Empire, the Pope had decided that there should be a split in power. Emperors would be the worldly powers, ruling the lands on earth, while the Pope should be in control over religious matters as a spiritual power on earth. In the Eastern Roman Empire, the emperors thought that the Pope should shut up, leading to a divide between Western Roman Catholicism and Eastern Greek Orthodoxy. The fall of Rome had also set Christianity back massively, with Ireland becoming a bastion of Christianity. From there, England, the Netherlands, Northern Germany, and finally, Poland, Hungary, and Scandinavia would be converted as well. These conversions were done by Christian missionaries, which were often supported by military might from kings and emperors. By the end of the millennia, Viking raids would decrease in quantity and the feudal system would provide enough security to allow cities and trade to come back. New advances in agricultural technology caused there to be a lot more food and thus specialization and commerce. Across Europe's rivers, cities would pop up again and paper money was invented to make cross-continent trade much easier. In Northern Europe specifically, a bunch of cities joined together to fight piracy, trade with each other and fight the influence of nobles and kings. This collection of cities would be called the Hansa. The rise of these cities meant a change in the European power dynamic. The increasingly rich cities started to demand more rights, which the nobles initially didn't want to provide. But the cities were so rich, many eventually managed to buy more and more rights from their nobles, reducing noble control over cities, but increasing the wealth of the nobility. The rise of cities caused serfdom in Western Europe to decline, as cities became the primary source of noble wealth, which caused managing the serfs to become a hassle. But perhaps the most important effect of the re-emergence of commerce was the rise of currency. European states were still ruled by kings via the feudal system, but the kings didn't really like that their vassals were doing whatever they wanted. This led to the process of centralization and state forming where the kings would attempt to reclaim control over their realms. They did this in two key ways. First, by hiring people to administer the land instead of giving them out to vassals. These people would remain loyal since the king could simply stop paying them if they weren't. And in a similar fashion, the king could now hire their own armies instead of relying on noble levies. With these developments, kings could start to knock out their nobles one by one, reclaiming control over their entire domain over time. As a result of this, kings could now start ruling their entire land from a central point and solidify laws across their land, a process we now call state forming. The success of this was mixed. France was extremely successful thanks to the Hundred Years War. The English held large amounts of French lands and when the French reclaimed these, the king suddenly held immense amounts of land himself. From there, he could defeat the nobles one by one. In Germany though, centralization failed to manifest 
as kingship was not hereditary, but instead, seven vassals picked the kings of the realm, meaning that they often chose weak kings to protect their own positions. Finally, England was very successful by making vassal lands not inheritable and creating sheriffs paid by the kings to collect taxes. Like discussed before, in Western Europe there was a divide between the worldly and the spiritual powers. But despite this, the Pope also had their own lands in Italy. The Pope and the Emperor got into a discussion over whether the worldly or the spiritual power was the stronger one. The Pope would win this discussion by excommunicating the Emperor, leading to revolts in Germany which made the Emperor beg for forgiveness. In the meantime, the Eastern Roman Empire was not doing very well, getting overrun by the Seljuks. This led to the Eastern Roman Empire requesting aid from the West. In support, Pope Urbanus II declared a crusade against the Muslims to help the Eastern Romans out. This crusade was meant to strengthen the Eastern Romans, as well as securing the Holy Land for Christianity. Many Christians joined in this crusade as it gave a free pass to heaven and would give the chance to conquer some lands. This first crusade was very successful, but soon after, Saladin would reclaim the Holy Land again. And despite numerous new attempts, the Christians wouldn't manage to take the Holy Land again. Elsewhere though, crusades managed to drive the Muslims out of Spain, while the Germans would conquer Eastern Europe for Christendom. And here, we're entering a new era. Starting in 1500, the Renaissance begins in Europe, as art and knowledge from the ancient era is rediscovered and people start prioritizing their life on earth over the fear of eventual death and whether or not to go to heaven. Sparked by curiosity, desire to find Asia, spices and gold, as well as the desire to spread Christianity, Europe would start to explore the rest of the world. This would cause Columbus to discover lands west of Europe, after which Americo Vespucci discovers that it's actually a whole new continent and not in fact Asia. In search of gold and wealth, the Spanish conquistador Cortes conquers the Aztec Empire with just 300 soldiers, after which the conquistador Pizarro would conquer the Inca. The reason for this Spanish success was because they had superior weaponry and horses, which the natives didn't have. Meanwhile, the end of the Middle Ages would see a massive surge of criticism towards the Catholic Church. The Church is too wealthy, they sell free tickets to heaven, clergymen married and had kids while they weren't supposed to, and more. Martin Luther particularly disliked the Catholic Church and decided to break with it. The Christian world from this point splits between Catholicism and Protestantism. Protestantism itself would be split between two main sects, Lutheranism and Calvinism. Lutheranism believes that good deeds and going to church means that you can go to heaven and that a ruler has the authority to dictate religion to all the subjects in his realm. Calvinism instead believes in predestination, meaning that people are bad in nature and God has already assigned people who can go to heaven at birth. You can only go to heaven by living a sober life and rulers shouldn't have a say in the religion of their realm. And here we finally come close to history actually starting as the Dutch are soon to revolt. The Dutch states were, at this point, unified under the large Habsburg Empire. The emperor of this Habsburg realm, Charles V, would start centralizing his lands and persecuting the Protestants of his realm. When Charles V died, his empire would be split with his son Philip II gaining Spain, the Americas and the Netherlands. Philip would continue the policies of his father, leading to the Dutch revolt thanks to centralization, the persecution of Protestants and high taxes. The actual start of the revolt would happen as the lower Dutch nobility asked the Spanish representative in the region to stop persecuting the Protestants. The Spanish representative says yes, actually, but as Protestants can now legally meet up, anger boils over and the Protestants start destroying churches across the Low Countries. Philip II is extremely pissed and sends the Iron Duke, Alva, to punish the ones responsible. William of Orange flees, raises an army and comes back to start a revolt. He marches around a bit, getting chased by Alva, but there is no public support for his rebellion. Soon, his money runs out and William's rebellion mostly subsides. It looks like the Spanish will win. But then, some rebels accidentally capture the city of Den Bril, causing a domino effect in Holland and Zeeland, as city after city suddenly decides to side with the rebels. The unpaid Spanish soldiers in the Netherlands then plunder Antwerp out of discontent, causing the rest of the Netherlands to join the revolt as well. The Dutch officially renounce Philip II as their king, but after a massively successful counter push, the Dutch revolt is almost destroyed, only surviving because the Spanish armies retreat to attempt an invasion of England, which fails. 
From this point, the war cools off a lot and an armistice is reached. From 1648 onwards, the Netherlands are finally fully independent. The Dutch then found the United East India Company, unifying all Dutch merchants going to Asia to stop competition internally. This India Company is allowed to negotiate on behalf of the Netherlands, wage war, build forts and get some monopoly on Dutch trade east of the South African Cape. This India company would be the first company in history to start selling shares and it would diversify itself into not just getting the goods from Asia but also refining it themselves as well, massively increasing their profit margins. Thanks to the success of the East India Company, the Dutch also set up the West India Company, which attempts to capitalize on the triangle trade between Europe, Africa and the Americas but it never manages to become as successful as its eastern counterpart. There is also a big difference in how the companies operate in the two different regions. Africa and Asia are, for now, too powerful to directly conquer for the Europeans, meaning only some coastal forts and trading outposts are set up. America, on the other hand, cannot resist the Europeans leading to direct colonies and most of America being carved up by Europeans. The Dutch become extremely rich thanks to trade with Europe, Asia and the Americas, leading to the Dutch Golden Age. Meanwhile in Europe, the Age of Absolutism would begin. Like discussed before, the kings had broken the power of the nobility, but now they wanted even more control. This once again failed in Germany, leading to the German kings to focus on their lands in Austria and mostly dropping the idea of a unified Germany. Meanwhile in France, Louis XIV would manage to consolidate almost all of the power in the nation in himself, ruling with near absolute power. To legitimize their rule, rulers would start to refer to divine right, arguing that kings were God's representatives on earth and thus were the only legitimate leadership. Meanwhile in England, there was a conflict between king and parliament over who was in charge. Initially, the parliament beheaded the king and turned England into a republic, but soon the monarchy would be restored, leading to renewed conflict between king and parliament. This would lead to Parliament asking William III of Orange, Stadtholder of the Netherlands, to become King of England as well. Meanwhile, the Dutch government form was very unique for its time. While most of Europe was ruled by monarchs, the Dutch were a federative republic. The Dutch Republic was made up of seven republics which all governed themselves, which sent representatives to the Estates General, the central government. The Estates General had three tasks, budgeting the army and navy, taking care of foreign policy, and governing the Generality Territories. Generality Territories were parts of the Dutch Republic which lacked the self-government that the others enjoyed. The most important one of these was Brabant, taken from Spain during the war, which was too Catholic to receive self-government. The other one was Drenthe, which was Protestant like the rest of the Netherlands, but was simply too poor to get self-government. By far the most important republic within the Netherlands was Holland meaning that they got to send what was known as the Council Pensionary to the Estates General, which got to lead the discussions and foreign policy of the Republic. Apart from the Council Pensionary, the most powerful figure in the Dutch Republic was the Stadtholder, a hereditary position inherited by the descendants of William of Orange. This Stadtholder would be in charge of the armies and navies of the Republic, since during wartime you needed decisive action and you cannot lead by committee. And this is where I reach about halfway through my textbook, meaning I will end the scenario here. Let me know if you enjoyed this video and if I should make a part 2 for the rest of history or a follow up video in which I note the flaws which I see in the education. Or maybe link your own historical summaries from your high school so I can make a video on other regions as well. For now though, I will thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed the content, consider subscribing and leaving a like and a comment to help against the algorithm. A special thanks to Yoshi, Jonathan White, Predator, Greyshot151, John, Przemek Petrosky, Firelord Marklin, Dinkelberg and Slayer for supporting me on Patreon. Consider supporting me there for about 2 weeks of early access to videos and a shout out at the end of every video. Again, thank you all for watching and goodbye.